What are you like? The Enneagram and Christian discipleship. And today we look at the personality type number two, which is known as the helper. Last week we looked at personality type number one, the reformer. And this ancient tool is based on the idea that there are basically, in every culture, every age, nine different personality types. And our personality develops from the day we were born until the day we die. And each type has a way of looking at the world. It's all unconscious. Obviously, as a baby, as a toddler, there isn't that awareness that this is how we're doing it. But we look at the world in very different ways and navigate and negotiate the world in very different ways. And our defenses, our ecosystem, actually develops in very different ways. We're not aware, and whereas some of that helps and serves a purpose, we all end up walking through life blind, on automatic, reacting to things rather than responding. And it can get us into relational troubles, it can get us into all different types of troubles. And our hope with this Enneagram series is that Through this tool, through looking at scripture, through trusting God, each of us can become more aware of what we are like as we become more Christ aware, what Christ is like, what Jesus is like, and what that says about God. And with the help of God to start taking off this persona, personality, this mask that actually isn't the true self, it's a false self, and become the people we were created to be, the essence, the goodness of who we all are. To put to death the ego, to put to death the old self, again, with the help of Christ within, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the helper, the type two, we look to scripture and I think there are many things that indicate that Martha might have been this helper type person. Think about the story we've just read. She opened up her home. Type twos are very good, very hospitable often. And you'll notice with a type two person, if they have a home, it is often a place of refuge for friends. It is often a comfortable place. So that rings true with Martha. We also notice that she was running around helping, preparing all this food for the visiting rabbi, Jesus. Rushing around, rushing around. And helpers are very good at noticing the needs of others and then trying to fulfill those needs. Sometimes they get it right, they're very perceptive, but sometimes they shower people with gifts or they shower people with advice or they shower people with love when actually they're overreading. What does Jesus say? He says, you're very worried about a lot of things, but only one thing is needed. And some commentators over the years are reading into that, that Jesus is saying, look at all this food you're getting together. Actually, only one thing is needed. Let's keep it simple. But also listen to his response when she goes to him and says, can you get her to help me, my sister Mary? Can't you see? Can't you get her to help me? And this is another feature of the type two personality that often, often they rush around, helping, 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 and resentment builds up. It's all unconscious, but they start to resent the fact that they are always the one rushing around helping. And when the resentment builds up, they can sometimes snap and we can see the ugly side of this type two personality. And she's actually being very out of order, the visiting rabbi coming to the home and having a go. Don't you care? So it's bringing out that more ugly side. But again, Jesus says, you're worried about many things, but only one thing is important. The reminder as we look to Mary, her sister, who was sitting at the feet of the rabbi, this is radical stuff, by the way, because Mary should not have been where only men should be. She should be in the kitchen helping as well in that culture. 
So Jesus is speaking into that. And actually, many women in this culture feel forced into being this type 2 helper because it's expected culturally in many ways in a patriarchal, male-dominated society. So some people who think they are type 2, who are women, actually, they might be misidentifying their type because of the cultural pressures on them. So radical stuff going on, as it always did with Jesus. But Jesus is making the point as well that our doing, our giving, will exhaust us. We will miss the point if we don't also take time to fit, sit at the feet of God, at the feet of Jesus. Our doing is to overflow from our being and our growing from that healthy place. We also learn from the Gospel of John a little bit more about Martha. And Jesus hears the news that Martha and Mary's brother, Lazarus, is very ill and dying. And these important words we hear from the Gospel of John, her name is mentioned specifically. Jesus loved Martha and Mary, and jo but she and Lazarus, but she is mentioned specifically. This is the key thing for all of us to know, and especially for twos in all their helping, that actually the base for all of us to live is the knowledge of God's love and other people's genuine love for us. Because often what the two is doing is trying to generate love for themselves, loves from doing rather than being. We also notice in that story that when Jesus gets there, in their eyes, too late because their brother Lazarus dies, we see the resentment coming out from Martha again. She rushes up to Jesus. If you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And again, with the type 2 personality, there's this unconscious understanding that if I go around in life helping everybody, you better be there when I need your help. And if not, my resentment's going to come out. I think potentially in the next chapter of John, in John chapter 12, we see some growth in Martha. Because in this next scene, again a few days before the Last Supper, when her sister Mary this time is washing and anointing the feet of Jesus, we simply hear that Martha was serving at this meal. And maybe this growth had gone on. There wasn't this resentment. The serving was coming out of a place of knowing that she was loved and accepted. Other things about the helper, the type two. It's a real deep desire. And we've all got a bit of two in us, but some have this more than others. We all want to be loved. And there is this longing to be loved and this understanding that type twos will get as a child, that to be loved, you need to give. You'll only receive love if you give. It's not unconditional. Whereas Jesus reminds us again this morning, God's love is unconditional. All healthy love is unconditional. Giving without expecting something back. And for the helper, they get very, very, very good at helping. They are feelings-based people. They're part of what's called the heart triad. So some of the numbers are head types, some are gut types. The twos, the threes, and the fours are feelings-based, very heart type. They're very perceptive. They can go into a room, and if somebody is there who is going through an emotionally difficult time or feels very, they will pick it up because they've almost trained themselves unconsciously from childhood to pick up the needs of others. They are very relational very warm people, lots lovely about twos. But twos will rush to help people, and sometimes reacting rather than responding. And that can get into all kinds of unhealthiness because relationships become a little bit unbalanced. People can become dependent on two type personalities. And they will say things like, I don't know how I'd live without you. I don't know how I'd get by without all your help. And of course, this feels good to the two. But actually, the relationship is becoming more unbalanced 
and it is feeding the ego of the helper. So for each separate number, there is a particular ego problem, a passion, a deadly sin, a vice that each number has struggled with in particular. Last week we heard with the reformer, the one type, that it's anger. And for the helper type personality, their thing is pride. Because in all of this, it's very tempting to get proud. I'm good at helping. In fact, I think I might be the best at helping. And helpers, in order to help other people, they repress their own needs because they haven't got time for it. So they push their own emotions and needs down and pick up on the needs and emotions of other people. And there can be pride in that as well. I don't need help. I'm here to help. And they don't know how to ask for help. It's sometimes the case that in a helper's early childhood, they had to help out. Maybe they lost a parent. Maybe they had a sick relative they had to look. And that sounds great, and it can be great, but it's also the place for pride to grow. Look what I had to do. I was very good at this. And some say this might have been Martha's background as well. Martha and Mary and Lazarus were presumably quite wealthy. And some of the thinking is maybe they were orphaned young or one at a time, one had to look after the parent. Maybe Martha took on this responsibility and maybe some of her pride and her wanting to help came from that and resentment as well. The Enneagram shows us the path towards health and growth if we become more aware of our stuff. And the virtue, the path for the helper to go is from pride to humility. And it's a tough old journey because humility comes through being humbled. Imagine how hard it is for a helper to recognize most of what I do is actually because I want something back. It's very humbling, quite painful, very painful. The passion, actually, think of the passion of the Christ. Often it is painful to work through. The truth will set you free, but as we said before, it can make you miserable first. Imagine the humility of recognizing I have all these needs and I have this longing for love that actually I don't feel is being met. Why go on such a journey? Because Jesus came to set us free, and this false self we are living out, it's exhausting. And it's unhealthy relationally, because you never know, you never know as a helper, if that thanks is about love, or just thanks. You never know if you will get something back. And actually, why not just accept that we are loved for who we are without having to buy that love? It's because we can get to a healthier place where we can still keep on giving and helping, but it's coming from that place of health and virtue. Noticing needs, not reacting, ah, I'll help you, I'll help you, but actually weighing and responding if that's the right thing to do. Peter mentioned as well that each number, there's lines on the diagram, we go to a different number under stress, under insecurity, disintegration. And for the two, under those circumstances, we can go to the eight type personality who is known as the defender. And they're more in touch with their anger and control issues. So twos, when they're under stress, sometimes will get more in touch with an anger, with a strength, and an ability to do what a two finds really hard to do. Say no. So it can be a good place to go to, even though under stress. Under health and security, then the two will go to the four, which is the individualist, which are the people who 
are able to spend and want to spend more time on their own. And their heart types, so they're very, very good at emotions, but the two is looking at other people's emotions and not so much looking at their own. Uh, whereas the four will be very in touch with their own emotions. And it's very helpful for the two to go to this place. It is a bit like, I would suggest, going away from people to sit at the feet of Jesus. The contemplative. It might help ground some of this if I tell you that I identify as a two. I identify as the helper. And in some ways you can look at the external things and it's obvious because I was a social worker, probation officer, I was a counsellor, helping, 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 and many ministers are actually twos, not unsurprisingly. But actually, when I look back deeper at my childhood, and it was quite traumatic, it was quite mucked up at one stage, and my reaction, I didn't realise at the time, but as a little boy, when I was ten, I wanted to connect with people. Twos want to connect because they want that love and that affirmation. So when I was gazing at Katrina's eyes above the dining room table at school, I wanted to connect because I wanted to know that I was lovable. And when I got all my money, my coppers and 5p pieces together and wrapped them in a plastic bag and gave them, trying to give to receive, put them through her letterbox, it's because I wanted to be loved back in return. And if you think that was young, my first day of primary school, I was hanging around outside the school play, wanting to catch the eye of Snow White, the head person in the play, because I wanted to be loved. And if you think that was young, I remember when I was four years old, holding hands with a girl, four years old, and walking off into a field together, seeing my mum watching us from the distance and hitting the deck but it's because I wanted to be loved. I was the teacher's pet at school. <laughs> I was the person who would take the apple to the teacher or produce a piece of art because I wanted to be loved. If I give, I'll receive back. And that went on at secondary school. That went on at university, trying to catch the eye of the lecturer because I wanted to be noticed and get something back in return wanting to be loved. What about my path? It's hard to talk about your path. As Ian Cron, who's an Enneagram specialist, says, we all need to do the work. And I was doing the work before I learned about the Enneagram. But it's not because I'm really clever. It's because humility has come where it's come through being humbled. This helper had to get help because some of the stuff from my childhood was so painful. When I look back, I had a number of what I would call breakdowns as a teenager. When I went to university, I had a breakdown. Went to another university, things were going well, but this pain came back and I had to receive help, otherwise I would have gone under. So I went to see a counsellor. That was so hard, so humbling, so humiliating but it helped a bit. So when this stuff re-emerged in my early marriage and it all came crashing again, I risked going to receive help from another counsellor and it helped. And then a number of years later, as a dad, I trained as a counsellor. I had so much counselling and found it so helpful, so I learned that it's okay to ask for help. And that's why now I have no trouble asking for help and I'll see a spiritual director. I'll ask people for help in very down-to-earth ways as well. I also look back and think that I've learned to say no. Partly professionally, if you can't say no as a social worker, probation officer, if you can't hold the boundaries as a counsellor, then you'll be useless. But also as a minister... It is interesting for ministers because if ministers can't say no, it brings so much unhealth into a church. 
If ministers are people pleasers in the way that many twos are, you can imagine how unhealthy it will be. I don't want to rock the boat. I want to say yes to everybody. I don't want to cause any disruption. So I'm not going to say no. And not only does the minister go under, and many do, but people in the church become dependent on the minister in an unhealthy way. And ministers can get the Messiah complex. I'm the only one who can help. I'm the only one who actually can do all this pastoral stuff. There is only one Messiah, <laughs> Jesus. So thank God, and I do thank God that the professional training helped me and my personal stuff, the struggle, helped me to be able to say no and also not to run around trying to sort everybody's problems out because that is bad for you. Because what we all need to do is learn to become dependent on, not a two, not a minister, not another person, but on Jesus. That is the best that a minister can do. That is the best that a minister can encourage. That is the best that we can all do, actually, with our friends and relatives. Dependency in the right place. And I think that's why a lot of our pastoral stuff is not trying to take over, not always saying yes, but actually inviting somebody, coming alongside, inviting them to look to the one who can help. That's why we offer our teaching. Because twos are very good at giving people solutions and giving them answers. Whereas actually, no, we will preach, we will offer. We will offer pastoral advice. But it is between you and God, the Holy Spirit within, to grow and decide and discern. This two stuff comes into all relationships. But the one I've been reflecting on, it comes into big time is for parents. If you think about it, a child, a baby, is so dependent on the parents. And that is right, and that is good, and it applies to all of us. But imagine the double whammy for a helper, for a two. You suddenly have something, a life, that depends on you. You need to be needed, and you meet it in your child. But the truth is the best thing that a parent can become for each child is redundant. Get to the place where they do not depend on us anymore. Where they don't need us in that needy way anymore. We as parents are to encourage the children to fly the nest for their good not to remain in codependency, but it's really hard because it's lovely to be needed and we're only being loving, we're only trying to help. But we end up neutering our children and keeping them in that place of dependency. A bit like pastorally, the best we can do is encourage people to find that strength and ability and the answers within with, we believe, the help of God. I find that one a struggle. Because it's lovely to have that connection and intimacy with your child. And I've had to learn, and I'm still learning, that the healthy thing is to keep on letting them go. If you let them go and they come back, that's love. If you let them go and you don't see them, there was never, never love there in the first place, you could say. But it's so hard. One of the most beautiful moments and the most painful moments I had a few years ago with one daughter. She had to make a decision in life which was very painful. I knew the answer. In my humility, I knew the answer, I thought. But I knew that I could not tell her the answer because that would be just building up this dependency on me. And I painfully wanted to tell her what I thought was the right thing to do for her sake. But I had to do the most painful thing of leaving her to decide. And she did. She made a choice. And in her making the choice, she grew. And she came through that situation. 
Let me draw this together. We each have all the numbers in all of us. But for some of us who will identify as a two, you might have connected with some of what I have been saying. It is good news because once we spot it, we can avoid the holes in the path and we can get to walk around them and we can grow and we can be a healthy version, a healthier version of whatever number we are. Now Jesus has often been identified as a two. And I like that because it puffs me up. But actually, if you think about it again, he was a healthy helper. He was able to receive help from others. He was even able, if you think about the ten lepers he healed, and he noted, only one of you has come back. Thanks are appropriate sometimes. And he noticed when something was wrong. But that wasn't coming from his ego and his neediness. That was just coming from a healthy response. Jesus knew the health of going away to solitude. To be with his father. That's an encouragement to all of us. He wasn't actually a two. Jesus, I believe, is the healthy version of every number because he was the perfect human being showing us what God is really like. Can I encourage you on this journey to trust God, to be open to God, to trust the spirit within and remember what he said about Martha. Jesus loved Martha May your growth, may your freedom, may your better relationships with others and your deepening relationship with God all grow out of the truth that God loves you and me. Amen.